Yo, what's up? This is Chris Casparosa, and the following is a conversation I had with my friend Christian Cipollini, a true crime author from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a little over two weeks ago on August 19th, 2018. Christian has written a number of books, a number of them about true crime books about hitmen and assassins like Murder, Inc., Mysteries of the Mob's Most Deadly Hit Squad, in addition to Diary of a Motor City Hitman, about a black hitman from Detroit back in the day named... Chester Wheeler Campbell. Christian even has a true crime book in addition to a comic book series on Lucky Luciano, who he's an expert on. He's also a producer on an upcoming documentary called Dope Men. But a few weeks ago I saw online that he's working on a new project about a Mexican drug cartel assassin based out of Northern California who apparently, according to the reports I saw, reported to a drug cartel out of Mexico, specifically, allegedly, the Sinaloa Cartel, which is allegedly run or was allegedly run by Joaquin Guzman, a.k.a. El Chapo. But as for this hitman, his name is Jose Manuel Martinez, but he was known as El Mano Negra. Now, El Mano Negra is also the title of Christian's project about him, which in English translates to The Black Hand. More importantly though, to my knowledge, According to everything I've read about Mr. Martinez, and also according to Christian, who is in touch with Martinez, you know, he actually packaged the life rights to his story to not just write a book about Martinez, but to even maybe turn his life into a comic book series, maybe a documentary or a movie or a TV series. I mean, who knows? But what I'm getting at is that Christian is in contact with the guy. It's not like he just read a couple of articles on the internet about him. I, it's funny, he actually like posts pictures on Instagram of like screenshots of his video chats with Martinez because the prison he's in allows the black hand to video chat. <laughs> to my knowledge, and according to everything I'm reading and what Christian is reporting, Jose Manuel Martinez, the black hand, El Mano Negra, he's not a snitch. Which makes him different than, I want to say, most of the other true crime guys out there that are telling their own stories. Most of them are government witnesses, cooperators, you know, whatever you want to call them. Stool pigeons, rats grass, whatever. Now, if Mr. Martinez was one of those guys, if Jose Manuel Martinez was one of those guys who, to save his own ass, got on a witness stand and tried to get himself out of trouble by testifying against other people, trying to put them in trouble, and especially if Martinez was not just a witness, but a liar, because all too often the guys that cooperate and get on witness stands, I don't want to say every one of them, but from what I've seen... A lot of times, the guys that get on witness stands, they don't do it because they had a change of heart. I'm not talking about civilians, like innocent people. I'm talking about career criminals. A lot of the times when they get on witness stands, they don't do it because they had a change of heart or because they want to do the right thing and change their life. But instead, a number, at least from the occasions I've seen, a lot of the time they tell outright lies about others to get themselves out of trouble, fabricating crazy stories sometimes in the process. Now, if Martinez was one of those guys, I would not have done this podcast. But if I was going to talk to Christian or anybody else working on a project about a guy like that, giving them a platform to tell even more lies in the process, I would have approached it very differently. I mean, I would have had to ask pointed questions, I would have had to grill them a little bit, rather than just having a fun conversation like I did here with Christian, who's my friend. Now, if you know me, I mean, because I can't glorify something like that. I can't glorify somebody who... I can't give a voice to somebody who, to get themselves out of trouble, put somebody else in trouble, and maybe lies about them, about the things they did to get them in trouble. Now, if you know me, you know that I'm working on a docuseries right now with John A. Gotti, John Gotti Jr., called Witsec Mafia. And, it, you know, it's about these witnesses who, after getting out of Witsec, out of protective custody in prison after they cooperated, how in far too many cases they don't change their ways, but after getting passes for their old crimes... They get right back into it, start committing new crimes, in many cases in conjunction with other witnesses who receive passes for their old crimes, many times murder, and they're like linking back up and committing new crimes. This is going on right now. Now, in a number of the cases we're profiling in Witsec Mafia, these witnesses who even know they're actively committing crimes, they're also out there telling people that they're changed men. In many cases, promoting themselves as motivational speakers or reformed individuals who, again, at the same time, are committing new crimes. Well, in many cases, these witnesses who told crazy lies on the witness stand, once they got out of prison and out of protective custody, out of WITSEC, they 
you know, sometimes they've published books full of new lies. Listen, my philosophy is if you want to tell lies about yourself, whatever, who cares? That's your business. But when you're telling lies about others, as many of these quote-unquote reformed witnesses are out there in the media doing, while they're also still active criminals but telling people they're changed men, I mean, if you want to publicly lie about others, especially individuals with families, children, etc., that's fucked up. That's very fucked up, and it's something that I can't and don't rock with, and I would never do a podcast or anything else glorifying an individual like that, like those guys. But to my knowledge, El Mato Negra, the Black Hand, Jose Manuel Martinez, he's not one of those guys. He's just a guy that got arrested for a murder in 2013, then for whatever reason began... (coughs) For whatever reason began admitting to over 30 murders. I don't even know what the final number is. But he started confessing to like over 30 murders in different states that he claims he did. And so far, he's been allowed to plead guilty in different courtrooms in different states to, I think, 10 of them so far, while investigators are trying to work out the guilty, trying to work out the the details and are investigating the details for other hits that he supposedly did. But apparently, Martinez did all this, admitted all these murders, without pointing the finger at anyone else, just talking about himself. You know, listen to this short clip of Christian describing him before I comment a little further. Like, who is who? who is the Black Hand? Who is this guy? Who is the Black Hand? Jose Manuel Martinez, going by the name El Mano Negra. Who is this guy? He was arrested in 2013 for a murder. Once he was incarcerated, he almost immediately confessed to not just the murder they brought him in on, but proceeded to tell the authorities he had killed ultimately over 30 people, most of whom were sanctioned, paid assassinations, with his employer being a Mexican cartel. Uh, he's possibly freelance, but basically worked for certain individuals more often than not. He has been killing professionally since 1980. Now and it's now 2018 for anybody listening. Yes. So he's being held in a jail in Florida while other states, a half a dozen or more, are sorting out how many unsolved murders on their hands have something to do with El Mano Negra. And as they're finding out, the information he's providing is only information that a killer would know. So this guy is basically a hit man that they have also dubbed a serial killer because he's left bodies all over California Michigan, Florida, Alabama, New Mexico, in actual Mexico. Uh, He is uh, definitely something of an anomaly, Uh, a doting grandfather slash heartless uh, killer who really feels no empathy for the victims, but yet knows he's probably doomed to um an apocalyptic uh afterlife in hell i think that's a good place to end it right there <laughs> Is that good? it's chris again here and that intro was recorded at the end of the episode conversation that we did because when we just started talking we never really introduced who el model negro was we just got into a conversation about the guy but yeah so this is a podcast that i did with christian about jose manuel martinez el Mano negro and uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to do it is not just to learn more about El Mano Negro other than just some brief articles that I had read on the internet after I saw that Christian was doing a project about him. But for a few years now, I've been meaning to start a podcast, not to do like some weekly radio show, but just I keep meeting interesting people and hearing interesting stories. And I think not just true crime stories, all kinds of stories. And I feel like they should be made more public and it might be fun to talk to people and learn more about them. And I have like a list in my phone of just different people I've been meaning to talk to. And Christian's on that list. And I was telling him for months or maybe even a year. Yeah, one one day we should do a podcast or something. And then I saw that he packaged the rights to this this Mexican hitman. So let me find out a little bit about it. Now, 
if you want to if you want to find out more about Christian, you can contact him through his website, ganglandlegends.com. He's also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at Gangland Legend. Singular, the website is plural, at Gangland Legend on social media. As for myself, you can check me at Casparosa.com or on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, at Casparosa, K-A-S-P-A-R-O-Z-A. And of course, Witsec Mafia, the docuseries I'm producing with John A. Gotti, a.k.a. John Gotti Jr., you can find more about that at WitsecMafia.com or on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at WitsecMafia. But here's Christian and I on what I'm sure will be a kick-ass movie one day or a documentary, a docu-series, a comic book series. I don't know, but I have a feeling I have a feeling Christian's going to do something good with this. So enjoy and thank you for listening. And so I want to bring more unknown stories out there and talk to me. <laughs> oh, well, hey, uh, I'll tell you this. You're... You are really one of the first, too, mm-hmm. uh, on this. Um, yeah. We haven't uh, – I mean it was so much uh, hurry up, wait, be quiet, don't say anything till everything was – the ink was dry. And um, yeah, you're basically the first podcast um, uh, that's really going to cover this. I briefly mentioned it on one of my buddies' podcasts, uh, but it was really at the end and in short. So mm-hmm. – you're gonna get it all here. This okay, is the, this is the premiere. Because I, I mean, I I read some stuff here online that he even like wrote like love letters to like Melania Trump from his prison cell after pleading guilty to like ten murders. You know, it's like so. <laughs> it's uh, so. What so? What's the story here? Like, how, how did you connect with this guy? Like, like how, how did you get him to tell you his story? Like, how did this all come together? And who is this guy? Like, wow. Well, this this was. Uh, there's probably. God, there's probably a lifetime movie in just how me and my business uh, partner colleague on this even came to – arrived at this point. Mm-hmm. What uh, what happened, the short version, uh, Andrew Dodge, who uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, he operates the um, True Crime Auction House. This uh, Andrew's been dealing in – what they've dubbed murderbilia. Um, yeah, it's definitely not for everyone, but anything from Charles Manson's strands of hair to artwork done by whatever serial killer. Is that, is that, is that something you collect? No, no, uh, no, I'm not. uh, All right. I'm I'm a strange kid, but so am I, (laughs) who else puts on a podcast? So, (laughs) right. Um, but Andrew, he and he's a younger guy. He's in he's in his later twenties, but he's been doing this for uh, God, almost uh, ten years. He's definitely one of the main people in this field, which I wasn't even that familiar with. But because, as you know, Chris, we all kind of run in the same circles. We all, sure. and, you know, everybody Small who's world. into uh, true crime in general, um, regardless of what your particular your niche. degree of separation away from somebody else. Really, yes. the whole entertainment business, it's like, you, you know, you, if you don't know that person, you probably know somebody who knows them, you know, so. Exactly. We, we are kind of one big family, even though we all have our own um, more centralized niches or interests. But what happened, again, the, to the short version, Andrew had got keyed on to El Mano Negra when the guy first got arrested in 2013. And he just was following this story and ended up writing to him in uh, prison, getting in contact with him. And uh, Mr. Martinez responded to Andrew, um, basically. On on, on like the first letter or was he like writing him for months or? uh, No, he wrote him back pretty quick if I've got this correct. Um, This was before I came into the picture. So 2013, Andrew tries to talk Jose and to give him a little bit of his story, maybe giving him if he can get anything out of prison that would be worth money. He would put like, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but Andrew basically like, hey, I'll put a couple dollars on your books so you can make phone calls and stuff. Send me something or, you know, he has his ways of doing this. Um, but anyway, so at first um, – Martinez thought Andrew might be a cop or not who he um, 
presented himself as and literally sent him a threatening letter. <laughs> this is the funniest thing, and believe me, that, this well, that would be a good way to infiltrate uh, infiltrate a hitman. You know, what does oh. that mean? Like there are like true crime writers who are secretly like undercover feds, like trying to get people in prison to give up. <laughs> I think that's a screenplay waiting to be written. Um, yeah. <laughs> right there's a whole another thing. That's another show. Um, <laughs> but Andrew gets this letter back, and it literally has a stick figure hanging from. Uh, like like the hangman <laughs> drawing, and it said, "This is you if you're lying to me, amigo." And it it horrified him. But when I saw it, and, and it's just funny. Let me jump ahead. Is every yeah. time I talk to Jose, we bring it up. We're like, "Hey, Jose, remember that time you drew Andrew with the noose around his neck?" And and he laughs and he says, "Oh, amigo, it's a misunderstanding." <laughs> but um, it, that's how that's. The short version of how Andrew became acquainted with with Jose Manuel Martinez. Sure. Again, I'm not going to jump ahead so I don't bore everybody here, but Andrew and I had been talking, and every once in a while he'll get one of my books and he'll get it into the prisons, and those guys they pass my book around like <laughs> like a prison bitch. Can I say that? <laughs> That's oh, I, I I I I wrote a book. Like five years ago, I self-published a, a novel. Not that it was like some masterpiece. I no, didn't I really know what the hell I was doing, but I, I did. I did get a, a notification back that a hitman from the Bonanno crime family read it, and like and he he critiqued it. He was, he was like, "Well, you know, you know, I'm, you know, not that I was a murderer, but to my knowledge, a murder, you know, it wouldn't happen like this. It might be more like this." And I was just like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> but that's for for the listeners to to get this. This is what we deal with, right? <laughs> I mean, this is the kind we we get used to this though. That that's the kind yeah. of world we've entered where yeah, real former wise guys and <laughs> like former federal officers will be glad to critique and explain to you <laughs> how things go. Um but anyway, so Andrew um occasionally would hit me up and say, "Hey, so and so, this serial killer or this mass murder or whatever, read your book he wants you to write a story and, and it's very in a way i don't know how to say this without just saying it, it's it's kind of flattering that these i was guys... I, I was flattered when a guy accused of multiple murders took the time to read my book yo what's up this is chris and just real quick i wanted to mention that the name of the crime novel i published in 2013 is for blood and loyalty which yeah an individual who was convicted in the 1990s of committing six murders as a member of the Bonanno crime family, and who was suspected of committing dozens more, critiqued, and seemed to enjoy. There's a new edition of the book coming out soon, and perhaps I'll reveal who gave me the review and what they said in it in the new copy, but for now, you might want to pick up the version that's out now, which doesn't have that review on it, as it might just become a collector's item. You can find it on Amazon, or at forbloodandloyalty.com. Thank you very much, and back to the podcast with Christian Cipollini. It is flattering when anyone, let's face it, anyone tells you they've read your book, yeah. is, whether they loved it or hated it, as long as there was some emotion provoked, I always say that's a good thing. It's when somebody goes, meh, you know, then yeah. your book... It sucks. So I don't care if it's a gangster or, or a, 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 a kid that's never picked up a book before. I feel, I don't know, flattered, good sure. that, that it did something. But it, I guess he was passing these around, and a few guys wanted stuff. And Andrew usually would tell them, look, Cipollini covers mostly organized crime. He's not going to cover some guy that carved up some people and put their genitals on a lamp. You know, like he's like, that's just not his thing. I, I mean, I know I'm exaggerating. To, well, not really. But he would – like Andrew would cut them off the pass saying Cipollini probably isn't going to cover this as other people that do because that was always my thing, Chris. We all have our specialties. We bounce off each other and, and get info. But like I'm not going to write the next In Cold Blood because I'm not – you know, like my colleagues that are more like Truman Capote. That's you're going to write the first El Mano Negra. Yeah, that's right. That this is mine, but this is very definitely daunting because it's 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 got different dynamics to it than anything I've covered before. But to jump ahead again, so eventually last year, early last year, mid last year, Andrew brings to my attention El Mano Negra, and I was going through a lot of. 
crap last year. Like I was just trying to sort stuff out. It was a very sedentary year for me. Whereas the year before I was traveling all over the country doing presentations and it was so chaotic, busy, but good. The the last year was very sedentary and, and I wasn't sure how to deal with that. So I kind of got caught up in doing stuff behind the scenes and working with um, Seth Ferranti, for those who know who he is. I, I, there's some secret projects I had going on. and I, I, I have a lot of respect for Seth. You know, I, I had like – I. I don't know, this must have been like, this might have been like eight years ago when he was still in prison. I mean, for anybody that doesn't know, Seth did like, I think, what, 21 years in prison from like, right. from when he was like 20 years old or 21 years old. You know, he served a lot of time for for a nonviolent weed charge. And I think he also was on America's Most Wanted. That's a whole other story. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. But, it could be a lifetime movie. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but like, but I, I had commented on his website, GorillaConvict.com, when he was still in prison. And like, again, this might have been like eight years ago, seven years ago. I don't remember how long ago it was. And I got an email back from him, like, forwarded to me, like, uh, from prison, from, I guess, his wife, who was running the whole business for him, or whatever was going on. And I got into communication, and I remember him telling me when he was in prison about you, yeah, this guy, Christian Cipollini, or whatever, and, and like, and he sent me, like, some of the, like, the, the stickers that you guys had made, or whatever, but he, he was, like, telling me about you back then, I remember that, so. Oh, wow, that's, yeah. man, that, that, it feels like yesterday, but you bring it up, it also feels like it was a million years ago, because that's how we really got uh, our start like yeah. he and i becoming and again how we even met because he was in minimum security by that time he was able to yeah I think he was in arkansas look. yeah in and, city or wherever yeah and and it was nice though because he had access to some online stuff and that's how we met was through the same circles that most of us in this field meet mm -hmm. in in the social media good or bad social media does have its event <laughs> um but Seth, yeah, Seth and I last year were working on a doc. I'll just say this much: we've got a documentary in the works that we've been working on for. Dope Man, what? right? It's called. Is that it? What's that? Dope Man. Is that the title of it? Oh yeah, yeah, right. Because we yeah. have leaked. Uh, yeah, we're we're really excited. That was a lot of work, but that took up a lot of my time. And every once in a while, Andrew would uh, hit me up to do something. But okay, so he gets me kind of interested in. Uh, Jose Martinez. Uh, I guess Jose then got a hold of my books, my comic book. Uh, actually read them. That's the other thing. Just to go off on a rant here, you know, a lot of people blow smoke or criticize, but yet even friends, you're like, did you ever even read my book? You know, you always wonder. This guy, oh, I knew immediately he actually read my books, and because he had a lot to say about it. Um. But he decided he wanted me to deliver his autobiography and or biography basically and, – and I think I can say it this way because we've talked about it. El Mano Negro wants one thing. He wants infamy. I am not <laughs> going to put around this. He wants infamy. He knows he's never getting out of prison. He wants a legacy and, because he is a family man. I think he wants at least if it was bad. Now, look, I'm not putting the judgment out here. I'm just saying in my experience and knowing this man now, uh, uh, he, he wants something out of all the bad stuff. Okay. I, I don't know how else to put it. Does that make any sense? I think it's pretty cool if that's the right word. I don't know. I mean, I'm not trying to denigrate like the families of his victims or any their right. memories or anything like that. But I think it's how can I say? It? I I respect him being straight up like, yeah, I want to be fucking infamous rather than saying like putting on some fake motivational speaking campaign. Oh, I want to help kids, but uh, can you put three thousand dollars on my books? You know, like it's no, like, it's you know. So I, I respect that his honesty. Let me put it like that. He's a straight shooter. I mean, mm -hmm. all, a lot of these guys sometimes embellish stories, and, and I, I can tell you in, in my, again, experience and looking at this, he's a pretty straight shooter. He's not ashamed of what he's done. Um, that's for people to, you know, people can judge as they want, but he isn't bullshitting me about trying to save the world or anything like that. He wants his infamy – 
And he also wants, if there's anything positive to come out of it, like that his family that still has remained close to him will, ha I don't know, will have something from it. So that's that's the short version um, of of what he's thinking. But I I'm not going to deny. Once I finally stop dragging my feet and I'm like, okay, Andrew, I'll talk to the guy, get him on the phone. I talked to him, and you know what, Chris? He was I don't know how else to put this. The <laughs> dude was charming as hell. Um, I. I was immediately drawn into him, and I, I consider myself type of person. That I, I can. I, I'm very particular about um, sensing very quickly if, if somebody has it has that charm that, that can really draw me in. Like when people ask me, "Why are you? What's with this mission about Lucky Luciano?" And I, look, I don't know why, except that. I have been drawn to that. Like, I don't want to get all weird and ethereal and all that, but I'm telling you what, there's some things give me zero interest and motivation. And, and though I can study it, but there are things that, you know what I mean? That where you're just drawn well, in. I'll, 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 I'll say this because you were saying before, I don't mean to cut you off, but you were oh, saying but... before, like, you don't even know if people read your stuff or not. I, I have the, uh, the first, uh, comic that you put i think it was called the scars born the first in the lucky luciano series that you put out right yep. and you know what was cool about it to me was that i had never read a comic book on amazon on kindle before and like for anybody if you've never seen this you should check out christian's comic book about lucky luciano like because it's it was so cool to me on kindle that like like the frames like popped out and like it, it's hard for me to explain i don't know how you put it into words but like the like, the images, like, jumped, literally, like, they popped out and, like, into, like, separate frames and everything. It was just so cool to see, like, like a comic book like that in, in, in a digital form. I had never seen anything like that before. I was like, wow, this is really fucking cool what this guy did over here. I, I didn't, uh, no, thank you, first yeah. of all. Thank you very much. And to my artist, Evgeny Franca, that was the first time he had ever done anything, uh, like, crime-related. And he knew nothing <laughs> about the mob yeah. in the 1920s before taking on that project. So, and the whole team behind Stash Comics and Comicsology, they they rocked it. I had never seen a digital comic until mine come out. Now I'm like, wow, some really Man, pop. That's cool. Oh, thank you. And but yeah, Luciano and El Mano Negra. Which, by the way, since you mentioned that, Jose mentioned to me specifically once on the phone how he really loved that comic book too that was yeah. his thing yeah he was like oh i like <laughs> luciano and all right anyway but that's it i was basically dragging my feet dealing with other projects dealing with my own you know personal bullshit whatever was going on at the time last year and andrew kept kept up on me he kept telling me you, you gotta look at this guy you got Got to talk to him. He wants to. He wants you to do this. And what happened? You know how you have those epiphany moments. Those hey, wake up, asshole. You should really, you know, look at the writing on the wall. I thought, oh my, this could be a really big deal for me, for Andrew, for this particular individual. Um, you know how it is, Chris. We work our asses off doing this and it's not like we wrote 50 shades of gray we we, we don't have a million dollar deals in front of us all the time you know what i mean well, i'm it, trying to get one i don't know about you but well <laughs> not tomorrow, we're but, all um, trying to get them <laughs> it, it, so. it, but you know the struggle is real and, and we Man. love doing it there's no bitching about it we but then you see the opportunity like this is even unique for me wow can i handle this this is going to be daunting and you kind of it's not that you doubt yourself but it's a lot of work to sit there and go through files and transcripts and all and piece things together. It's it's a whole different thing than just making up. Not that writing fiction is easy. That that's its own challenge. But it's a lot of like tedious work to just sit there and go through all this stuff. It's like if you know if you want to do it for real and not and tell the truth, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, I so. I'll tell you what. I, since you brought that up. You and I are going to get off on so many tangents here, but this is, I, I, I I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't need to cut you off, but just one, I'm going to have to pull like an introduction to this or whatever, saying, yeah, this is about a guy who's a hitman, because I don't even think we mentioned that yet, but oh, <laughs> maybe yeah, we did. Oh yeah, throw it however you want, oh yeah, yeah, and any, <laughs> well, I'll try to answer every thing, yeah. de more detail, I know I'm getting off, but I did want to 
say about the fiction thing, you know, just about me for a second. I grew up thinking I would probably be a fiction writer. And here's some – this is my major respect for poets and fiction writers and stuff like that. I realized that I was forcing it, and I sucked at trying to make fictionalized stories, and I was trying so hard and forcing it. You know when you force something, it looks like garbage, okay? You yeah. can't fool anybody. I didn't know growing up that I just happened to be more inclined – to digging the research to do nonfiction. I had tried so hard. Like, that's why I have massive respect for fiction writers because y'all can pull stuff right, I mean, and put it together and make it believable. Whereas, you know, I'm spending how many hours uh, digging through some, some people say, oh, I can't believe it. Days and days and digging archives. And I'm like, yeah, but I really you for being able to come up with this stuff in your own head you know i anyway that's my thing about that but see, but, see but but who knows though but maybe like five years from now you'll, you'll just get a new gust of wind and be like oh shit i'm, I'm I, you know i'm gonna write the next reservoir dogs so i don't know you say that uh, i mean i'm again i'm, I'm kind of flattered because you never know and you're yeah, right who knows? it's like you might just get some inspiration six years from now or something that just changes your whole perspective on how to go about it and who knows? So, you know. Oh, you might be right. See, I'm my own biggest cheerleader, but I'm also my own harshest critic. Mm -hmm. and but you have to be. So. Yeah. And I'm out there rah-rah my stuff, and then other time like when someone says, hey, would you ever think about writing a fiction novel or, or, or something like that? No, I'd suck at that. You know, that's not <laughs> – oh, I couldn't do that. I'd be terrible. Um, But who knows? But we, even with this El Mano Negra – this is different because, as Chris, you know, my particular specialty was predominantly a lot of guys who have been dead for a long time. We're talking about 1920s, 30s, New York, Detroit. Um, well, even into the 1970s, my first book, most of those people are no longer with us. Uh, some mm -hmm. are. Um, but this, this is right now. This mm -hmm. is contemporary on so many levels we still have the issue with the cartels we just had the el chapo thing i mean people still know who pablo escobar is like you know even millennials know who yeah, he is. they're they're not forgetting anytime soon so <laughs> no no and it's kind of like when you think of the, the the iconic names of the last 20 30 years we got Gotti, we got um escobar now we have el chapo well jose Manuel Martinez wants to be among them, and look, I, I can't deliver on ever. You know, I'm not promising the world here to anyone, but as I told him, I said I can give you a certain degree of what you want. That I will guarantee. And um, but here's my caveat: uh, after I do release memoirs uh, edited, uh, when I do my version, it's going to have three sides. To the story, and you and I talked about this off, you know, off air. Three sides to every story. I'm going to get, you know, input from other sources too. And he was cool with it because I, I said you've read my books, Jose. You know, I, I. If some people say I glorify or I lean towards. Oh, okay, whatever. But basically, you'll see I, I, I put in all the sides and kind of try to let the reader decide like hey not everything good is as good as you think it is and not everything bad is quite as bad as you think it is right i, I mean am i wrong here well here's what i wanted to ask you because i because when you when you were saying before that he wants infamy i wrote down a note here and i was thinking to myself does this guy want to be like lucky luciano because you, you wrote you know where you wrote about lucky does he want to? You said he wants to be among the Lucianos and the Gaudis and the, the Escobars of the world. This guy, so to my knowledge, this guy pled guilty as of right now to ten murders, and he's looking at more murder charges that he's being invested. He confessed to like over thirty murders, and he thinks he's going to die in prison from the death penalty in Florida. Did I? Am I getting that right? He's not even sure where they're going to eventually put him. You're you're pretty much on point. He confessed very quickly to the Alabama authorities when he yeah. was caught. And then they put him in Florida, and they're basically holding him there while every other state that's potentially involved yeah. 
yeah. decides on how to indict him, what they're going to do. He just knows he's never going to see the light of day but, from already the convictions. But but done. does he believe he's going to get the death penalty, though, and they're going to yeah, just put he, him down? He, it's, it's a distinct possibility. So, it, so, so let me ask you, though. He wants infamy. Do you think this guy is delusional? Do you think he's, like, sane when he talks to you? Or is he, like, totally psychotic? Or... Is he just, you know, he's a murderer, but he's pretty mentally stable. He's just, you know, just a psycho murderer. Like, like, really? like how, really? how, how would you categorize this guy? Like, who is, who is this guy? A good question, Chris. Um, yeah. And I, we should probably preface this by saying, look, we are not psychologists or psychiatrists. However, when you're studying and researching, writing this kind of stuff, meeting people within it, you learn a little bit about those things. We're not sure. experts. I will say this. Um, when it comes to sociopathy versus psychopathy, uh, someone like El Mano Negra definitely is, is on – there's a line there, a very fine line, and I'm not sure which one he falls exactly, and, and when I do get – bearing of that i probably won't even reveal that until the book but um, <laughs> let's just say to answer your question he's extremely charming he's quite he's got quite a sense of humor he is um and forgive me jose if you hear this but i'm calling it like it is there's narcissism and there always is a, a dose of narcissism i mean you probably do have to think pretty highly of yourself to kill 30 people you know yeah. You, probably yes. have to, you have to have to think you're you're pretty capable to go about that, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, there's 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 levels of narcissism in in. Uh, first of all, you can't really survive in the underworld unless you do. Do you know what? I had a therapist once tell me that um, artists and writers, uh, if we didn't have a little dose of narcissism ourselves, we'd probably never make any money. Those are the ones that don't make any money. You can only be so humble. I mean, I'm not, but. To succeed in what you're doing, you almost kind of have to. So yes, imagine that um, amplified. Jose is proud of uh, his skills, but he <laughs> also has a flip side that comes out in, yeah, I've done a lot of bad, and I kind of know I'm probably going to hell for this. Um but not in a like rah rah way, you know. It's not like yeah, I'm gonna go to hell, you know, f you all. But <laughs> there are moments where he says, "State me." Like I asked him once, oh, I don't want to give his no. You know what? I'm giving you this. <laughs> um, he, I, I asked him once about the um, saint that the narcos uh, tend to gravitate towards, um, uh, Jesus Malverde. Okay. And I asked him to tell me a little about that, and he said – I'm paraphrasing this part, but he said, yeah, Jesus Malverde, that's you know the patron saint of um, you know the drug traffickers. And then he literally said, fuck God. That's who I look to, and you're like, wow, um, I don't know what – that's like just a powerful statement no matter where you come from on the spectrum. That was just that – those two words. And then later he will say something like – almost like he hopes there's some redemption in the afterlife, if that makes sense. I, I mean again, I'm – I don't want to give away everything, and, and I'm not proposing that I'm some expert in, in the psychology of it, but I've gotten to know Martinez more and more every day. Uh, that what, what, when did you first like start talking to him? Like When did you connect it, with him? Uh, the first communication was via a postcard. Um, uh, let me see. I want to say late last year, early this year. I know Andrew, Andrew Dodge, who again is my um, partner in this. He w had almost was serving as like a middleman between me and Jose for several months before we actually started communicating. Mm -hmm. And then the postcards came, and then that. What kind of what kind of postcards do you get from a guy that's you know, has 
pled guilty so far to 10 murders in court. Like, he was allowed to plead guilty. If, if, if it is 10, if it's not more. And it is, has confessed to uh to the authorities, like, 40 murders or whatever. Like, what what do those postcards look like? Do they have drawings on them? Or, like, is it, like, a sunny beach on the other side? Or a stick <laughs> figure hanging from his, from a noose? Like, what's well, on these postcards? Before they apparently, before I came into the mix... Uh, Martinez was able to send actual letters, uh, uh, correspondence with people. And Andrew, like the the letter with the hangman's noose, was is actually on a piece of yellow um, legal paper. But the rules changed in that jail, where he can only receive and or send a special postcard that you can only get at a post office. So I started sending him letters and they were getting sent back to me. And that's when I realized what was happening. And Andrew already knew this. It was just a miscommunication. He had kept up correspondence uh, forwarding my messages to, to Martinez until I figured out what was going on here, that the prison was sending back all my mail they were rejecting it is what they were doing and because i wasn't sending it on this stupid postcard mm -hmm. um but i was getting postcards and what do they say uh an example of one uh dear mr cipollini um uh I need you to call me. We we have a great story here. I really want you to write my book. Uh, sincerely, Jose Manuel Martinez, a.k.a. El Mano Negra. That is a simple one. I have more, far more detailed I, I, one. I, I think yeah, you have to you have to think uh, pretty highly of yourself to to end it with a.k.a. El Mano Negra. You know, because it could have easily just been Jose Manuel. But uh, when you put your nickname at the end of it, yeah, you, I think you believe in yourself. Oh, he's, oh, you're very right, and he's very <laughs> proud of it. In fact, like I, I can never see myself writing an email to somebody and then ending it with like my childhood nickname. You know what I mean? Like, no. I, I just, I don't think it's like, it's like your, your nicknames are for other people to talk about you. Like, you don't introduce yourself as, you know, my name is. Oh, he Cowboy wants, Bob. You're so. absolutely right, and he wants known for that nickname. I mean, we again figured this stuff out very early on. He uh, loves it, and uh, just a, a side um, story to this. He laughed one time and told me how his his attorney gets pissed off because he signs everything El Mano Negra. You know, it just doesn't <laughs> help the case. And you've got to feel for the lawyer who's trying to just make this a little less uh, arduous and daunting. And, and here's Jose saying uh, – Fuck you! I'm putting, and that's how he said. I, I I know I'm kind of mimicking, but it's funny because he gets really excited about it and says, "Yeah, you know, fuck him. I'm I'm putting I'm putting that nickname on everything." And he does. He <laughs> oh, you gotta brand yourself. It's his hashtag. So. Oh, it's oh yeah. That's why I've <laughs> hashtag El Mano Negro. <laughs> yep, it's it's something else. But um, the correspondence. Uh, you were asking, just increased then, and we, we started doing three-way calls, Andrew, myself, and um, Jose did, and then uh, video calls. We can do those occasionally, and uh, Andrew and I are going to take a trip uh, to where he's being held to do some in-person interviews for – What do they have him right now? It's in Florida, right? Yeah, yeah, they have them in Ocala, Florida. Uh, they're still debating or, or trying to sort out w where the bodies hit the floor, so to speak, around the country. He wrote up very detailed lists, and this guy has a photographic memory. When I get a list from him <laughs> of any kind, I can assure you it is down to the detail. I mean well – names if applicable of... you know so I, I was reading an article about this guy earlier and it said that uh i think they quoted one of the police officers or the prosecutors or something saying that this guy just started confessing like he wasn't naming names of other people but he just started confessing like his own murders and he was just saying like details from like decades ago of like yeah this is how the body was this is the shell casing and just things that like yo you wouldn't have known unless you were there like these details right. so that, and that's how they knew he was for real like he wasn't lying about all this stuff the, the DA 
um, in Alab- I believe it was the DA in Alabama who, when I first really started looking into this uh, upon Andrew's request, and one of the first interviews I, I saw or read was with the DA in Alabama. And uh, to paraphrase him, imagine a scenario that was pretty much you sit this guy down who they think ha- was involved in a, in a murder. And it, it's one of those scenarios where it's like, oh, okay, well, you got some time? Why? Well, you know, and then starts into, you might want to call California. You might want to call Arizona. <laughs> you might want to call Michigan. Like, what the hell? And, and But yet, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, too, even that DA was saying how, you know, the guy was charming. He was open, and it was details that no one else could know, and you, you couldn't help but li- kind of like him. In a weird I, – I don't mean to make this – uh, sound, you know, creepy, weird, or s- some kind of, you know what I'm saying, but... Th- I mean, th- I, 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 I've interviewed people that are total fucking slimeballs and scumbags, that, but are, like, funny people that I'm just like, oh, you know, in another life, maybe I, I would have hung out with this person, I got along with him, but then you have to remember who you're talking to also, in the back of my head, I'm just like, yo, you're really not, like, a good person, like, I, I, <laughs> right. I don't know. <laughs> right, so. and, and you know what, on that, on that uh, note, Jose knows he's not an upstanding citizen um again i'm not trying to defend i'm not that's not what i'm here for mm-hmm. uh, Just trying but, to tell a story what happened yeah and in and as a writer and any writers out there of any kind know this even if you're being unbiased <laughs> look we're writers and we're going to weave in our own perceptions of what we're writing about or we sure. would be robots i have a per- perceptions and they may even change as this evolves you know right now i think jose manuel martinez is a fascinating individual that basically was doing this job for several decades before it came down and then one day he gets caught for something that wasn't a a paid gig and he just said i'm done that's it now the gig is up, you know. So, um, but 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 let me ask though, because I, I wasn't really sure what was going on over here. Is this guy like a cooperator, like giving up other people, or or was he just talking about himself when he just started confessing? Like like how, like what what's his deal exactly? That, I, I, I didn't really know like what it was when I was reading. That again is the million dollar question. Uh, it's a great question, Chris. Uh, he is a very smart individual he will Mm -hmm. say about himself that he's dumb and he only made it through the ninth grade and all this but believe me as i tell him he's he's smart he he's an intelligent guy he confessed to everything he did yeah he refers to employers as that guy or mr x which if this question would come up and i'm sure it will is Aren't you and Andrew worried, you know, you're messing with the cartel? No, we're not. We're not. Jose didn't flip. He didn't give anybody up. He gave himself up. He did his time. He did his job. He has nothing. You know, the details that he gives are are nothing that couldn't probably be discovered anyway as to, like, who he may have, like, what organizations or region, let's say, that he worked in. Mm-hmm. or four but there's no names there's not i mean he, if, if the guy's not like a cooperator i mean i don't think you have everything to be worried about from any cartel you know because if he's not a cooperator he's probably still on their good side they might even like the story being told because it makes them more like infamous or something without their names being mentioned you know and then if he's not a cooperator i mean i have to think and they didn't want you to do the book. They probably just tell you, "Don't do the book, or else." And then it's up to you, or else, you know. But like, right. so you probably, if you if you were writing the story of some big snitch or something, then that's a little bit of a different story. But right. Um, and and going back to even my decision to come on board with this, mm-hmm. uh, there were a lot of like you just brought up. There are a lot of variables that you sort out, you yeah. know, before you embark on anything you we're, we've been doing this for a while chris you know when yeah. you start out right you want to take on the world and whatever you're not thinking the way you do after you've seen some shit in the world and how this business even goes 
No, it's all mu- – hey, much respect. We're just trying to tell his story, and of course because this is my thing, I mean I want to weave in like how he fits into that greater dynamic. But no, he didn't – he didn't quote-unquote rat anybody out. He's only yeah. interested in ratting him, like, himself. He, he I- – I mean, if you're like, exposing their inner secrets, you know, then maybe you would have a problem. Because, like, in Mexico, they kill journalists down there. You know, it's not like in the U.S., but it's like they kill journalists in Mexico. But, I mean, again, if you're not exposing their dirty business, it's, I don't know, you know? Yeah, I mean, in there. May, may, maybe there's somebody that went on a job with, with this guy that, and now he's liable to be apprehended, you know? And then, I, I don't I don't know, but, you know, I mean, it, it's, if he's not a snitch, you, you, you're probably okay, you know? So, I'll leave it at that. He's right, not, and you know. he's he's not. These things were clarified way at the get go. Um, yeah. Jose um, is about him, you know, himself in that sense, and he tells the stories. He's very detailed about the victims. And, and look, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna beat around the bush here. He's very clear that there's no. Um, he doesn't feel much empathy for the victims um and again this to put it in perspective in case anyone's listening that doesn't know uh, a lot about how this works when you're a paid assassin for an organized crime (laughs) most if not all of the people you are paid to eliminate are themselves members of the underworld does that make it right or okay no i'm not that's not what we're talking about it, it's not you the, know what my my perception when i read an article in the paper that somebody got murdered or whatever for the most part generally speaking i mean it sucks for their family for their children their parents right. you know to go through that but when i and I'm, I'm not talking about just generally speaking when somebody got murdered by some drug dealer you know some like some crime related crime not like not like an innocent person that's a whole other subject but somebody that was a criminal themselves and they got murdered sometimes i think to myself well who knows what they did maybe they deserved it you know i, I don't know but i mean it's it's one if you're an innocent civilian who pays their taxes and you know helps the community whole other story right but if you're mixing you know with the underworld well maybe you know you knew the rules maybe you maybe you broke them you know so. it's part of the risk and yeah. and it, that's what we want to try to tell is is the story of how that all those variables fit together and someone like him exist, which, again, it, I don't want to give away too, too much. And I know a couple news interviews have, you know, talked about him. They went in there and interviewed him before I came on board, but. Um, all right, well, I'll... it's a big difference from telling writing, you know, like a five thousand word article versus a hundred thousand word book. It's a whole other thing. You know, well, so... right, and you're, you're exactly right. And if huh, what I have, what Andrew and I acquired from Mr. Martinez, is an incredible four hundred plus handwritten double sided pages of. Every detail that I for <laughs> you, even some, uh, well, let's just say even the people who really want to know this don't know some stuff that that we do. So, well, you, you know, you know what I was thinking before. I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, but because you're talking about that, but, about him writing all these details and everything, it's that we we're talking before. If you're at risk writing about this stuff from any alleged cartel members or anything, if this if this guy's not a snitch and he has family out there. He probably cleared it with whoever he knows to write the story, because if not, he's putting his own family in danger, you know. So, he, it's, fair, I, fair. I, would, I mean, I would have to think so. I, I, what do I know? But he is <clears throat> extremely protective in doting yeah. on <clears throat> his children, his grandchildren. I mean, he is, but the, and that get plays into the other side of the sociopathy versus psychopathy. You know, what one website. When this first all came out a couple years ago, they were calling him a serial killer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Interesting. Uh, I'm not quite sure that's accurate. Uh, I'll get into that more as as I'm developing these projects. But um, he 
is definitely someone with a conscience, okay? The separation between pure psychopath and sociopath, it, the, the simplest I ever saw in a mental health book was um, a psychopath is born with it. They are innately uh, non conscience okay? If they yeah. don't want to get caught, it's just because they don't want to get caught. They don't give a fuck about anyone, not mommy, not the world, nothing. A sociopath has a conscience. It's just very weak, and there's degrees <laughs> of, you know, hey, a CEO of a company could be a sociopath. doesn't mean he killed someone to get there, but he probably stepped on a lot of people on the way. You know, that's – but he may also love his grandma. I, I, it's it, I mean, if that makes any sense. The, the oh, it definitely point. makes sense. It's you know, it's. I mean, you could be a sociopath, that, you know, but you might not want to spend twenty five years in prison. So there's a limit to how sociopathic you'll truly be. Right, right, right. Now I, I think. I mean, I don't want to spend twenty years in prison. That's the reason why I haven't. I've no. controlled my anger in certain situations. But if no. I didn't have to worry about going to prison, it might be a little different. So. Well, I'll admit, I'll be the first one to admit. Uh, you know, I was a kid that. Grew up very straight and narrow. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I followed the rules, was afraid to step out of the lines. Um, and as I got older, and especially getting into this, and you see the different sides of the world, I'm not going to deny I am a bit anti-authority. For anyone that's seen my posts or knows me, I if get you could, If you could get away with it, how many people would you have killed? Oh, if God. you could just order murders like right and left, if you had a guy like Jose just at your disposal, how many people would you have killed tomorrow? You know what? Here, I can say this. I am <laughs> glad I, I made it this far in life to where I had a few epiphanies and <laughs> swallowed some bitter pills about my own like angst towards people, you know, some people from my past that I've kind of how can I put it? I'm glad I learned a little bit of what that word forgiveness means kind of because otherwise, if you would have asked me that maybe 25 years ago, I probably would have had a list as long as Santa's <laughs> of who was going to go um, because I – you know, I just – whatever. But now, no, I, uh, I think karma – comes to those who have it coming so i don't have to but if i mean i mean wow now that we're talking about it if I, I this also plays into it still would you kill because that was your job or would you kill because you you felt you had to either for your family yourself or just out of anger it's weird because again that's the where is where is that limit we all have I, or, or or where can we separate work from you know, just like the mob guys back in the day, not all of them were murder ink that like really enjoyed their work. Some of them was like, "Hey Charlie, you got to go whack Johnny," and you know Charlie's like, "Oh, all right," and he goes and does it, and then goes home and has dinner and just doesn't talk about how his day went. It doesn't mean you know he was a psychopath, but you kind of got to be of a personality that can separate the two. Um, I don't know. It makes when I've written every one of my books has made me question myself. I had some dark times writing some of those books, Chris. I mean, like, were you by yourself for days on end researching guys like Harry Happy Mayon and Pittsburgh Phil Strauss? You start to question yourself, like, wow, could I do? And that's some dark places. But anyway, that's off on another thing. I will say this because I think it's already been revealed, so it, it's not like I'm giving it away. Here's the key thing that I found most interesting in the early part of talking to Mr. Martinez. Sure. When he was a teenager, his stepsister was raped and murdered. He knew who did it because he actually had driven her to – Again, a lot of this is out there, and I'll give more details when I release some stuff. But long story short, let's just say he 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 knew where she was off to. He had he had reluctantly taken her. They were in California. He took her down towards San Diego, and she was going to visit friends. But he kind of had a feeling she was going to visit some guys that he wasn't real keen on. Ends up she disappeared for a couple of weeks, and they found her body. 
they uh, told the family, questioned the family, and he said it to me like this. He said they they wanted a statement from my mom, and and his I believe it was his stepdad. It might have been his real dad. I, I can't remember because his real father passed away at some point. I'm sorry, but my head's a little all over the place. It's but um, it's the point being, Jose was 15 or 16, and the police questioned him, and he gave the statement very simple that he had no idea. Who would have done that? And then he waited. It took him a year, and he got the people that did it. He shot them dead, and this is what he said to me. It felt good. That was the profound pinnacle moment, the catalyst, if you will, that either brought out some inner sociopathy, rage, whatever it is, it brought it to light, and when you are the son of migrant workers, you, your family is originally from the Kulakan, Sinaloa area. Yeah, you have connections. All he's, from, he's from he's from Northern Cali, also, right? Yes, he. So that's like all that, like, well, according to the government, anyway, it's all controlled by the Duesha Familia. So. Yeah. And, and he's surrounded had, by it. He's up there by Salinas. I, I looked where the map was. It's, it's like, yeah. and it's he like had home base. Spent time all through California and yeah. in Mexico. So, uh, most uh, and most of his um, assassinations were done here. Mm-hmm. There was a handful done in Mexico. That is not the only thing he was hired to do, by the way, too. Uh, he had some personal rules. He would reject certain jobs, but there were uh, two types of things he generally did. One was deliver packages, and I don't mean drugs, and the other was um, making people dead. That To put it in the most black and white terms, if you – owed money were in the drug business and he came to visit you it's because your three strikes were up yeah and it wasn't always kill you the minute i see you sometimes it was deliver the package to someone else and um that one i find far more sinister and frightening in my own personal view was deliver what, what can you say what that means, or you can't like yeah. because I, I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. Deliver the package, like what? What is it? I can uh, speculate, but he had he has six rules for delivering the package. The package would be, let's say, like a human head. Like no, here's what I did last time. Pay up. Like what no, does that no, mean? even more sinister in this sense. Mister X calls you, says I need you to go get so and so. And I want you to bring so and so across the border alive. Gotcha. And when you bring so and so across that border and deliver him to a um, address that's basically a garage or warehouse, you leave, collect your money, and you can just use your imagination from there on. You know that's mm. some sinister shit there. Has he? Has he? said like how many kidnappings he took part in like has i have he given like a number like I have, I have i have the details and then some yeah yeah to answer your question yes but uh, can you say like what the number is or you're uh, saving that I'm not, no i'm not actually that i'm not i'm not giving you okay the the numbers of of what was what and the that and not because I wouldn't give it to you because I I would it's just that's part of the that's part of the bigger pie that I can't serve yet. No, I understand. Um, let's just say I think people are going to be in a little shock and awe. I think they're also going to possibly see slivers of um. Maybe not empathy, but maybe not even humanity, but where there was almost some. 
And then other moments... That... Well, again, it's also the people that are getting snatched or whatever. It's like, who knows what they did? You know, like, maybe maybe they raped somebody's wife or something. You know, who, who knows what the hell they did to get killed? I'm, and I'm not saying... Maybe they didn't do anything. It was just, I don't know. But maybe they did something really bad. Maybe the world's a better place that... without them. Who the hell knows? I will know? tell you this. And, and I know I feel bad because I can't, I can't divulge <laughs> what you're asking me. But how about it? since you mentioned this, I'll say that. He specifically mentioned one of his kills, and let me assure you, contained in the information and conversations combined, I literally have – Andrew and I literally have exact details of every single assassination and where, when, how, what friggin' time of day it was. I will say there was one – that he hit because they were a child molester. Oh, now, good for him. I mean, good back, for him for doing yeah, it, you know? The backstory, but he made very clear which one that was and that it was indeed a child molester that he delivered justice. Now, to um, add a footnote to that, Again, when, when we're putting together these projects, and Andrew and I have talked about this extensively, even in that, I'm going to try very hard not to levy my own judgment mm -hmm. either way. Like, this is the story. Yes, you'll get it where, uh, you know, again, as you and I talked about, a writer is always going to infiltrate with their kind of you know i don't know they'll weave in the way they they view it I, i'll certainly do that it's just i'm going to try to be as un opinionated up front about even that because there, there's again three sides to every story so yeah but well, it, it's well, for, uh, for anybody listening i mean hopefully more than five people listen but for anybody listening the three sides to a story thing Christian and I were talking about before this was um oh shit I'm drawing a blank what were we talking about no well, it was um that you know it's the world's not black and white that just because somebody's like, like killed thirty people doesn't mean they didn't also have a family side or a soft side you know it's you know the world's gray who, who knows yeah maybe this guy killed a whole bunch of people and. And but who knows? Well, maybe he also gave money to his local church. I don't know. You know. So. Well, and that, that's again the big, the broader picture of society, culture, all these things. We're not saying something's right or wrong or black and white. We're saying, look, here's how someone like El Mano Negra could even exist in the world as we know it. Let's look back at these factors, not to bore everybody, but. Here we go. It's like you know this, Chris. It's like we're going to beat a dead horse here. But hey, you took away drugs back in 1914. Oh, but people wanted drugs, so the mob delivered it. It was the Jews and Italians first. Then it was you know the African Americans and Latino Americans, and then there's a different group on top. Right now, it you know then it was the Colombians, and now it's you know from Mexico. There's uh, it, but the bigger picture is why economics, culture, we create the problems we're still fighting. It's not blame it on here, blame it on there. I want to show in every project I do, mm -hmm. not all law enforcement are good, not all villains are evil. And sometimes – there is pure evil in the world, and sometimes there may even be pure good. I'm hoping I find that one. I do. I, I, I'm, I'm a cynic. I don't know if you are, but I'm, I'm still hoping that there's a sliver of that in the real world. But our job as writers, I don't care if it's fiction or nonfiction, is to take people into a place that maybe they're not familiar with and give them a different world that's either going to – Frighten, excite, um, inspire, uh, or make them question their own choices in life. I know that sounds so. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I look at it like it depends what kind of writing it is. If it's like news writing, you know, for like 
political or, you know, something like that. That's, you know, the, the times are, or I don't know what the big conservative papers are. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's, if you're re reporting news, you're supposed to just report the news. But I think generally speaking, right. I look at it like if you want to educate someone or inspire someone or scare someone or excite someone or give them a, a ride to another world, well, the first thing you have to do is entertain them. You know, you have to give them a reason to read instead, and you can't bore them, but you have to entertain them. And then through that, you can school them, you know, on well, bring them into something that they don't know about. Even scholarly books can have an entertainment value. I, sure. You know, it depends on what you're doing. And, and don't get me wrong, there's some of what people would find otherwise boring facts and statistics kind of stuff that I like and read. But when I'm writing or, or doing a documentary film, whatever it is, or I'm on TV doing a show, I try to be entertaining in it because you're right. That's the key. If you're writing news, I want news delivered. Can you make it a, a catchy headline? Sure. I mean, I was a student of journalism. I get it. Even the stuff I read in my archives from the 1920s and 30s, they had some really clever ways of, of, <laughs> of, of, of hyping stuff, but they also had facts that you'll never see today. Like yeah. – I want to know that that guy had cigarette stains on his hand as he entered court. You know why? Because I just do. It adds a human element. Now, you'll never see that because of time constraints, the political climate of just the world as it is. You're never going to see reporters for well, the most part the, writing the news, those details. The news cycle is also so different today that – you know, with all the headlines and, and resources for newspapers are shrinking. So it's like, so they don't have the money to hire all these people to cover the stories. And if you have to, if you want to be work for a newspaper, you have to churn out a story so quickly that, and be on to the next one. Cause then the next headline is coming in 24 hours, you know? So it's like, I, I don't think they really have the time and right. Nothing to do it all anymore is exclusive. Believe me. I spent, I know we're off on another subject, but basically <laughs> I spent almost 15 years moonlighting as a freelance journalist everything from entertainment to local stories and trying to sell something as as it becomes more day to day it better be exclusive and you're like well what the hell is exclusive anymore there's 50 other you know how do you keep up with that i feel for anybody that's in this that you know area right now because i can't even imagine 10 years ago i thought it was a bitch you know, to try to get something as an exclusive or, or whatever. But I didn't even think of how that would segue right here, but it did. Um, with Again, when I decided to finally open my eyes and ears to what Andrew Dodge was presenting to me, I realized – in a way, wow, here's my exclusive. And I and I know before anybody says, oh, yeah, well, I saw an article, like, you know, in 2013, and, oh, so, you know, this website just, they were in there and filmed them. And, yeah, I know all about them. Believe me, I've had my little dealings with said websites. Um, here's the thing. Again, I'm going to get a little cocky, but Andrew and I, we got the goods, and we got the blessing of the guy who gave us the goods. So anybody and that, that's also going to be introductions to other people from his world outside of those gates that those other people would have never gotten to speak to. And you're going to get a much bigger story because he's giving you his blessing. Yes. And he was he he told us, too, he was so adamant. And, and again, I, I don't care what people say on this. I'm, I'm quite honored and, and flattered that, you know, this guy is alive and and basically trying to recruit me to, to tell his story, release his story. He tr entrusted me and Andrew with this. Mm -hmm. I, wow, you know, that's all I can say. But what he gives to other entities, even with his narcissism, and he admitted, he goes, yeah, I wanted to get famous, so I, I gave some interviews. But he didn't deliver all the goods. He was waiting for us. And, and then I realized, okay, now everybody wants <laughs> Board. I'm getting this, and what we did, which we haven't even really talked about in detail, I, I probably should mention it now. Yes, Andrew Dodge and I acquired the life story rights for multiple media avenues, should we choose any or all of them, uh, for an option for several years. Uh, basically covering everything from film to documentary to, to friggin' action figures if we wanted to do it. Um, 
You should do was... it. Put him in Spencer's <laughs> in the mall or wherever. <laughs> right? Uh, go to exactly right. <laughs> Why not? <clears throat> that's it. but that's what we carefully talked about it, discussed it with um, El Mano Negra. This is what we wanted. We we're like, look, we had our requirements. Martinez had his requirements, and we all came together over a period of time to basically iron this out. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to tell your audience right now. I don't know what all we are or aren't going to use of that. Um, I'm part of several documentaries, but I'm not a filmmaker uh, by trade, so I don't know that I'm going to make a movie. I, I don't know if I would write a screenplay. Uh, he likes the idea of a comic book. I made well, well, you never know. You, you put that out there in the world, and the next thing you know, you know, Michael Mann or Mark Wahlberg or De Niro or somebody's coming to you. Yeah, let's turn this into a film. So, you know, maybe exactly. you're not the, the director, but you're a producer. Yo, this is Chris again, just telling you that I had to pause the conversation here as we went off record for like, I don't know, 20 minutes talking about the entertainment industry and about movies and about how they get made, which is interesting because as our... As that part of our discussion wrapped up, he kind of like segued on his own into talking about adult film stars, porn stars, who he hangs out with, like female porn stars, and uh, which I was also meaning to ask him about anyway, because I see him on Instagram hanging out with Tara Patrick and these female porn stars, and apparently they're fascinated with him because he's a writer, and I guess the life of a porn star is fascinating too, but here's Christian on that. Hey, that was a gentleman. There's a good. totally related, but again, off on a thing story. Some who was it? Scott Bernstein, or maybe it was Seth. Somebody had said to me once when we were doing something. Go, I don't understand how all these porn chicks like you so much. <laughs> What's the deal? And I said, you know what? I really actually thought about it, and here's why. I said, when I go to these things, and there they invite me, and I get these photo shoots. Here's why. I'm not a threat to them. Because A, I don't treat them like I'm a fanboy. B, I don't treat them like anything except a person. I either like you. The, here's where I'm black and white in life. I either like you or I don't. You can usually tell pretty quick if you like somebody or not. That's. I don't care if you dig ditches for a living or you fuck on film. If I think you're cool or fascinating and vice versa, you're good in my book. I go to these things with Tara and they're they're enthralled that I'm a crime or like that. I don't know, porn – People just are fascinated as much with that as we are with what they do. And the other thing is I never once ogle, grab, say anything nasty. It wouldn't even come to my mind. I'm dealing with people who are working here, you know, and I'm helping. I, I just feel pretty honored. I get to, I'm get i a crime writer who gets to hang out with a couple famous porn stars every once in a while. But, okay. but I tell them, I said, you want to be a fanboy? You're going to be a fanboy to them. You know, I just treat them like – and there's some that are assholes, just like some of the mob guys we've talked to. Some of them are dickbags. They are, yeah. you know, and some are really cool people. You know, like Jose is a charming motherfucker. I don't know how else to put it, Chris. That son of a bitch is charming, and well, he brings well, – well, Let me stop you right there because – and if you give me the okay, I'll, I'll publish this or not. Yeah, go ahead. You but start. but I, I think that might be an interesting point to uh start publishing this audio again is where you just said this, you could just give your whole speech right there on on porn stars that you talk to. Is is that okay to to mention? It will go from there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so 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 I guess there'll be like a little clip before this that we that we stopped recording and I'm sorry we stopped uh that we talked off the record or whatever, but. I think that's very yeah. So if you don't know Christian, if you don't follow his Instagram, whatever, or his Twitter, is it Gangland Legend on Instagram and Twitter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... Yeah. So one of the things I found fascinating about Christian is that he's post he, he's always posting pictures with like with porn stars that he hangs out with, whatever, like Tara Patrick and other ones. <laughs> and um, I mean I, I don't I've never hung out with a porn star at least not knowingly. You know maybe if somebody does amateur porn or something they didn't tell me about it. But so when I was reading about uh. And we were talking about too, like, um, that you know, when you're dealing with uh, one of these psychotic criminals or whatever, or, or allegedly psychotic criminals or alleged murderers or whoever, when you're interviewing these people, that as long as you don't disrespect them, there's really no reason for them to disrespect you if you, you know, if you just you don't cross over a line and 
you know, and or or you don't get involved with crimes with them, you're you know you're pretty much okay for the most part. But in researching El Mano Negra, I learned that uh, while he's been in prison, he's been reading, if this is true anyway, in these articles, that he's been reading a lot of crime and romance novels and like Danielle Steele novels. Is that true? Uh, he and I have never actually discussed that. And yeah, it is out there in uh, some outlets that he does. I can tell you, Jose reads voraciously. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know, again, a, a writer always knows when somebody actually really read one of their books. This guy reads a lot, including my stuff. He's across the board. He communicates with a lot of people. He likes to write. He likes to write letters to people. Uh, he loves talking on the phone, and he loves reading. And he will read anything that he can get his hands on. So, yeah, I'm not surprised by that at all. So I so I was reading that this guy reads romance novels, whether it's true or not, who the hell knows. But like, so in, in your to your knowledge, how, how was this guy with the ladies? Like, and did did women flock to this guy? And did they know he was like this tough guy, or was he like an unassuming guy? To your knowledge, uh, like, he's like, a, again, er, the, the majority of people that I've spoken to or read uh, their comments upon having met him yeah uh, there's an overwhelming uh, view of of martinez as um a charming mm -hmm. uh, and a great sense of humor as for being a ladies man he fancied himself as one there's plenty of stories that the world <laughs> has seen but he, was he, he one <laughs> he definitely liked and there was a heyday you know he when he was busy uh making money he definitely liked to uh, party it up with um, with the ladies, whether he was in Vegas, wherever. He liked definitely. He still is. He st he loves getting letters from you know people in prison, particularly women. Who, so yeah. No, keep going. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's just I, I'm thinking about it. It's kind of making me laugh because of the way he tells the stories too. It's just funny. Uh, um, <laughs> he but yeah. He the short answer. Jose Manuel Martinez loves the ladies. So, so I read that he also um, wrote like a two-page love letter to Melania Trump and sent it to her. Is that is that true to your knowledge? Jose has never confirmed or denied that to me. Uh, <laughs> has he? Has he? Has, what's up? Uh, yeah, there's some things that uh, that are out there, and, and he's spoken about, and other journalists have covered. Uh, I have not. Um, had him confirm or deny that one to me yet well then let me put it like this has he expressed his feelings on the president on, on donald trump like what, what are his feelings on uh on trump if you can say we have not spoken about any individual in politics directly we have discussed law order and society politics in a more broad sense uh i know that's really vague um no but we have and i do that because i wanted a broader per perspective of how he sees um the world of like the upper world like how things should be run or if it even affects somebody who works and dwells in the quote unquote underworld, uh, if that makes sense. That's, that's what I was trying to do. And I haven't got into some of the specifics yet. Like what he thinks of the president. I know what he thinks specifically of, of a few certain people. I'll reveal that in one of the projects because he's very vocal about. I, I was wondering like what this guy who, confessed to like dozens of murders would say to the, like to the first lady and like like dear mrs trump come see me because i can give you like guns that your that your husband can't you know like <laughs> um I can only uh, uh, actually not to speak for uh, for jose martinez but yeah he might say something like that in a funny yeah. way it would as crass as it is 
I think we'll know what you know if if Trump starts tweeting about him like, oh, this fucking scumbag, he's trying to hit on my wife. <laughs> Get oh, rid of all the Mexicans. Oh, Stop this from happening. Yeah, my luck. Um, Jose would probably ask me to then re- start responding for it. <laughs> like, oh no, don't get me involved in politics. <laughs> I got enough on my plate. But yeah, he's definitely very unfiltered. Yeah. Um. Uh. Which, which I kind of, you know, personally respect because as you and I talked about off air, I, I know I get some flack sometimes because I'm unfiltered myself. Yeah. But he really is. There's, but there's, a, but again. It's part of his personality, and and he really doesn't mince words. If 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 you piss him off, he'll go. Oh, wow. Uh, okay, I think I can say this. And again, I, I'm going to use a vulgarity here, so but because I'm literally going to quote something. Uh, he had told. He was talking to my uh, business partner Andrew on a phone call. A couple weeks ago, Andrew relayed this to me, so you can call it hearsay or whatever, but we think it's pretty funny. Uh, uh, someone was making noise nearby where Jose was on the phone, and he, he like, paused for a second and then s- said to the whoever was making the noise, shut the fuck up. And then there was silence, and Andrew, kind of semi-laughing, said, Jose, what happened? And uh, Jose responded with, ah, it was some crazy person over here. I I told him to (laughs) shut the fuck up. And Andrew, just off the cuff, again, kind of with humor, said, oh, well, what happens when you tell someone to shut the fuck up? And there was a pause, and Martinez said, they shut the fuck up. And that was, like, almost a sinister kind of thing right there. So... So, you know what? This seems like a good place to, to do it or whatever. So, before, I think I mentioned that we never really recorded an intro to this about who Jose Manuel Martinez is, El Mano Negra. So, could you, like, give me, like, a description of this guy, of who, who this guy is and how many bodies and where, like, across how many states, you know, he's pled guilty to murders in? And then we'll put this at the beginning of, of the episode. Absolutely. Like, like who is who who is the black hand? Who is this guy? Who is the black hand? Jose Manuel Martinez, going by the name El Mano Negra. Who is this guy? He was arrested in 2013 for a murder. Once he was incarcerated, he almost immediately confessed to not just the murder they brought him in on but proceeded to tell the authorities he had killed ultimately over 30 people, most of whom were sanctioned, paid assassinations, with his employer being a Mexican cartel. Uh, He's possibly freelance, but basically worked for certain individuals more often than not. He has been killing professionally since 1980. Now and it's now 2018 for anybody listening. Yes. So he's being held in a jail in Florida while other states, a half a dozen or more, are sorting out how many unsolved murders on their hands have something to do with El Mano Negra. And as they're finding out, the information he's providing is only information that a killer would know. So this guy is basically a hit man that they have also dubbed a serial killer because he's left bodies all over California, Michigan, Florida, Alabama, New Mexico, in actual Mexico – uh, he is uh, definitely something of an anomaly, uh, a doting grandfather slash heartless uh, killer who really feels no empathy for the victims, but yet knows he's probably doomed to um, an apocalyptic uh, afterlife in hell. I think that's a good place to end it right there. <laughs> is that good? 
This is Chris Casparosa. Thank you for listening. And of course, you can find Christian at ganglandlegends.com, at Gangland Legend on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And myself, Chris Casparosa. You can find me at casparosa.com or on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Casparosa, K A S P A R O Z A, and uh, youtube.com slash Casparosa. Thank you very much. Peace.